and two out of three vaccines in global child immunization programs uh, are made in India. So India has got an extraordinary success in vaccine manufacturing and development over many, many decades. Absolutely, sir. And as you said, this is also the Satrangi Sabdata. From the Nilgiris to all over, we uh, have, uh, as a scientific uh, fraternity, really, really uh, come out victorious. So my next question is, uh, the Google charts are really going virus, uh, finding out what a vaccine is actually composed of. So I would like you to tell us, uh, especially the COVID-19 vaccine, what is there in the vaccine, sir? <coughs> Um, as I said earlier, there are many, many platforms which are used to make the components which stimulate the immune system uh, through a vaccine. Uh, so if, for example, you take the messenger RNA vaccines, they encode uh, components of the virus, and when injected, they make those components in our body. And once they make that, our immune system attacks. So to answer your question, they would be a message, the messenger RNA, as it's called, along with what's called a particle, so that it can be transported to the messenger RNA stable. Now, messenger RNAs typically are not very stable at room temperature, so they have to be transported very carefully, and mRNA vaccines, therefore, uh, have a very major cold chain requirement. The other type of vaccines are uh, vaccines <clears throat> which are like the AstraZeneca serum vaccine, which insert a component of the virus's coding sequence into another vector, and that's inserted, and then the body synthesizes that, similar to the messenger RNA vaccine. The uh, Bharat Biotech vaccine, Covaxin, in collaboration with ICMR, takes the virus, uh, grows it up in a laboratory, inactivates it completely to ensure that it's not infected, and then uses that, so not only um, one component, but many components of the virus's uh, proteins are stimulating the immune system. So there are many, many components. One important point, um, the virus, uh, the, the vaccine also has other components in it to make sure it is stable uh, and it also stimulates the immune system. So these are all other uh, things which are added. So it's not just simply uh, being able to make these components, which many labs can do but it's to make them in very carefully monitored facilities so that they, are, they meet the highest uh, medical practice standards and are safe to use. Yes, sir. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions on the hashtag, but maybe we, we could uh, do that a little later. A question that is coming to us, uh, flashing on Twitter also, is that if the vaccine has the pathogen, is there any chance that I would get the, vaccine, the disease should I take the vaccine? Um, in the uh, set of vaccines against COVID-19, uh, none of them have the pathogen as it were. Uh, you have inactivated virus, but the pathogen is completely inactivated, or you have components. So the vaccines will not cause the disease. In oh, earlier times, many, many uh, years ago, um, there used to be most vaccines were uh, attenuated vaccines. So they were active, but at a very, very low level. In some situations, they can uh, cause disease or mutate to cause disease. And those were the dangers earlier. That's not the danger in the vaccines which we're looking at now. Sir, and if I ask you, how are the two vaccines which have been approved by the GOI different, sir? Could you elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, you know, this is a um, matter which is very important to understand and to, important to understand in terms of uh, risk-benefit uh, uh, ratio, as it were. We must remember that vaccines are given to healthy people, and therefore they have to be very, very safe. They also have to be effective. There's no point in giving a vaccine which is not effective. And these are processes which are very, very long. Um, and therefore, the measures of safety, immunogenicity, what kind of immune response you get, and efficacy are part of multiple steps in trial stages. Safety is measured in the stage in phase one, but it's also measured in phase two and phase three, and also after introduction in post-licensure, post-marketing uh, surveillance. So safety goes across all the time and it's constantly monitored in different ways, in different contexts, in different numbers. Immunogenicity is measured 
by looking after you administer the vaccine, whether there's a response, even in the absence of the disease being present. So that gives you an idea that the vaccine perhaps is very likely to work. Now, you then have a situation where you have trials where you have the vaccine administered to a set of people and another set getting the placebo and both are exposed to the disease. And you ask how many people in the placebo arm are protected against the advancement of the disease and how many compared to those in the vaccine arm. So these are the kinds of stages which goes through. Now, in terms of the risks which are there in not administering a vaccine, those also come into play. Is the virus so dangerous that you have to compress or speed, uh, compress the stages or speed up the trials because you have to save lives? Is the spread so rapidly happening that you would be, you would like to have the trials administered simultaneous to, uh, you know, um, having the vaccines introduced? Those are the kinds of demands. Now, today with the SARS coronavirus 2, we are seeing an extraordinary surge in the uh, uh, in the in the expression uh, of certain mutant strains, for example, in the UK. So let me take the example of the uh, strain in the UK that grew in November in their lockdown uh, with very tight non-pharmaceutical interventions, whereas the other strains, uh, you know, decreased in the November lockdown. So the uh, you know. Our value, as it is called, for the other things became less than one, but this particular strain uh, went higher than one. So it's very worrisome and it caused an expansion. And the seeding of this strain uh, was extensive across England in October and November. And then there's a two month time lag, which we've seen that the seeding goes through to extraordinary large numbers. So this is the kind of problems you face, uh, which you have to deal with in deciding whether and when to introduce vaccines. Now, again, it's a bit long, but this is important. If you look at the seven day rolling average of deaths, of new deaths in India, it is now about 18 deaths per 10 crores as the seven day, as a daily average taken on a seven day rolling basis. If you look at the UK, it is about 1,013 compared to 18 per 10 crores on a seven day average. And in the US it is 808. In other words, it's not, people talk about as if the strain is a problem. The strain itself still is very likely to allow vaccines to be effective. That's not the issue, but the spread which the strain causes is a cause for serious worry. And therefore it is important to have vaccines in your toolkit, which you're able to use. And that's the, idea behind the emergency use authorization anywhere in the world. These are the kinds of risks of not vaccinating which are measured. Now, our regulator has given two kinds of approvals for two vaccines, the COVID shield and the Covaxin. For the Covaxin, our regulator has said that taking into account global phase three data and some bridging data from India, that an emergency use uh, authorization can be given and that authorization will have certain conditions of monitoring. And for the Covaxin, there will be, again, an emergency use authorization, but they will have different kind of monitoring until phase three results are also examined. So that's the kind of situation which has been done. And therefore the efficacy measurement for the Covaxin is based on an expectation that phase three trials will show that and an extrapolation of what the efficacy is in uh, non-human primate models. And therefore, that's why a different kind of uh, emergency use authorization are given. Both vaccines are safe. Both companies are extraordinary in what they have done. And I have no doubt that the safety and immunogenicity uh, of the vaccines are strong. And I also have no doubt that as the results come in for both vaccines, as for other vaccines under emergency use, all over the world, appropriate uh, ratcheting of the decisions will take place. 
writes a very broad perspective there. Thank you so much. I think it's been wonderful the way you explained the whole thing, and our viewers will get the exact picture. Uh, another question which has been coming, and I think I can clap two questions with your permission. How will the COVID-19 vaccine protect me from getting infected as well? And we go to the next one, and why are they booster doses, sir? Right. So as I said, uh, you know, by all laboratory tests and clinical trial tests, um, it seems that the vaccines, what it seems, the vaccines do protect against the progression of the disease. Uh, so that's that's the good news uh, over there. Um, and vaccines, you must remember, don't protect people against infection. They prevent, upon infection, the progression of the disease. So we must remember that there is... Uh, a requirement for us to continue to wear masks and keep distance until the virus is uh, reduced in the population because there will be transmission uh, until everyone or the very large number of people uh, are vaccinated. So that's an important point to uh, uh, keep in mind. So uh, vaccines certainly do protect. What is the second part of your question, sorry? The booster doses, sir. Yeah, yeah booster doses, yes. So, um, so booster doses are necessary because the first dose primes the immune system uh, and, and gets it ready. And that, in some kinds of vaccines, in some situations, would require an additional dose to boost up the immune system so that it is now at a level where it's ready for the infection. In other kinds of vaccines, uh, a single dose is often enough. But uh, the measures of immunogenicity, dosing, will decide whether one or two doses are enough. And this, this can vary. Uh, sir, the next question that I have is, uh, can I not continue wearing a mask to prevent getting the disease? I think so, you've elaborated enough. Uh, um, one has to wear a mask and social distancing is the norm of the day. So um, if you'd like to add something to this one also. Yeah, so I presume the question is that if you are vaccinated, should you still uh, wear a mask? Yes. Uh, yes, Carry you should on. until the entire... Or, or most of the community is vaccinated so that, you know, uh, people who are vaccinated don't transmit the disease to others who are um, not vaccinated, although they themselves are protected. So people are also writing in to find out how long will this protection by COVID-19 vaccine last? There seems to be good news on that uh, based on studies of how long the immunogenicity, uh, the immune response, to infection last. And more and more studies are showing that upon uh, infection, the immune system remembers for quite a while. Uh, I mean, the range is starts from eight months to a year, but it could well be a, longer. And there's reason to think that vaccines would offer protection at least in that range, if not more. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, another question that uh, most people want to know is uh, your take on will the vaccine have any side effects sir? well all all our lives is full of side effects you know whether you take uh, an aspirin or any medicine um, there is always uh, the possibility of side effects and those side effects fall into uh, multiple kinds of categories um, those immediately after taking the vaccination which could be minor aches and pains uh, they usually are not causes for worry uh, and there are others which potentially could show an impact in a slightly longer time frame. So typically, as I said earlier, the safety protocols involve uh, not just uh, at the early stages of phase one or two or three, but they go on in a post-marketing li uh, licensure, looking at larger and larger populations because uh, less and less frequent side effects or effects, uh, adverse events after immunization, uh, show up on that scale. Uh, usually, when vaccines are introduced, uh, you know, this monitoring, uh, uh, the early stage trials are such that, you know, the side effects will be for uh, the entire population very minor. Uh, there are some situations where care needs to be taken, for example, those who are immune compromised, but that is usually adjusted before the vaccination itself. Another question which uh, uh, is coming to my mind and I'm sure uh, most of our viewers also want to know is that uh, what is a clinical trial, if you could please elaborate. Yeah, in the early days of 
uh, the development of vaccines, uh, there were little or no trials. Uh, sometimes vaccine developers tried these candidates on themselves, on their family members, friends. Now, over time, uh, this has become standardized in a rigorous way, which is very good. And they, vaccine development, therefore, involves multiple processes which require permission. And that should be you know, something which all of us need to understand. First of all, when you make a vaccine candidate, even for testing, you need to make it under rigorously certified conditions so that you can then say it's a potential vaccine candidate. In other words, you just can't make something in the lab and say, here is my vaccine candidate. It has certain good laboratory practice standards which need to be done. Then those are taken and they are studied in cell culture. And those, again, are very rigorous. These are all preclinical steps, by the way, to make sure that the vaccine candidate meets standards. And then you go through animal trials again, which are rigorously monitored. Then you go to the clinical trial phase. In other words, when you try candidates on humans, they've already passed through a set of uh, trials. The phase one trial typically involves a relatively small number of people. Uh, could be varies with the disease and with the vaccine. It could be from tens to hundreds. And you can have, you know, you're basically testing whether the vaccine is safe, uh, checking the dosing and everything so that you know that what doses are okay and how safe the vaccine is. Then you go to the next stage, the phase two, where you check the immune response in addition. And this is in a larger number of people. And this can, again, depending on the nature of the disease and the vaccine, be into several hundreds of thousands. And then you go to phase three, where you go to many more thousands of people, where you actually expose the vaccinated to the disease compared to those who are not vaccinated and see what happens. So this is a long time and it takes, uh, permissions have to be given at every stage, data has to be shown at every stage, and this typically takes several years, if not decades, uh, for this program to go through. And during the pandemic, this has gone through very speedily because the risks of not vaccinating are so large. Uh, which is, uh, is it safe to participate in a clinical trial? Would you like to say something to this one? Of course, uh, uh, people have already participated and you have people all over the world which has participated. The reason it's called a trial is because we want to know the answer to a question. If you knew the answer about safety and immunogenicity and efficacy, then there would be no need for a trial. And therefore, there are indeed challenges in participating in trials. But this is a very, very important public good, which all of us, when able, mm. should, should do that. We must not behave as if that we want the results of the trial to be administered to us, but we will not participate in the trial. That is, should not be the case. Uh, there has been a very pejorative term called guinea pigs being used uh, for those who are under or part on a trial. And that is wrong. Uh, every one of us who meet the standards required for a trial, particularly those who are well-to-do, who are educated, uh, you know, they should step up in the front. They should lead them. So participation in trial is a matter of public good and pride and not something seen as, you know, let someone else do that and we get the product. Yes, sir. So it's absolutely safe, according to Professor Vijay Raghavan, to uh, uh, also take part in a clinical trial. There is just no two about that. So the next question is one from uh, the viewers who's asked us, should I get my nine-year-old daughter vaccinated? Oblique slash, should I get my 80-year-old father vaccinated? Slash, can I get vaccinated if I'm pregnant or lactating? Slash, I have diabetes. So uh, will that so have any... Basically, basically uh, this is an important question. So the question being asked is, uh, vaccine trials take place in defined groups, and usually those groups are very carefully studied, for, particularly for uh, depending on the disease. But in the case of SARS-CoV-2, there is um, sort of, there will be um, stratification saying that the trials will not be done, for example, at this stage on pregnant women or on very old people or on very young people. And then the vaccine goes through all these trials. And the question then arises, do we then introduce them into 
those categories. Uh, and the reason why the answer to that is yes, in this case, is medical professionals estimate the value coming out of these trials compared to the potential risks of vaccinating those who are in strata which did not participate in the trials. And that is a call they take entirely on a complex set of medical grounds. What are the you know, presentations uh, and the risks of vaccination in a pregnant woman for this kind of a vaccine uh, or for a baby or for an older person or for someone who's diabetic? So one should go for um, the view, uh, a decision taken by your uh, healthcare professional on these kinds of matters. And I'm sure that will be a wise and correct decision. Uh, my next question is, why are we not able to eradicate diseases like we did with smallpox, sir? This is a very uh, important question. Why is it that some diseases can be eradicated and others not? And this comes from a very important quality which we need to understand about life itself. Life, all life on Earth, comes through the process of evolution by natural selection. And that means that all life is related to other life forms. And that means the viruses which infect us also infect other animals, like bats and cats and dogs and birds and so on and so forth. If a virus infects only us, then it can be eradicated. But if a virus is because of a zoonotic spill, that is, it has been there in another animal and comes, we can keep diminishing it in our context but eventually uh, it can spill out, spill over again. And therefore we have to be very careful with those kinds of uh, infections. They can never be eradicated, but there can be, uh, you know, their spread can be prevented because we're aware of it. So there are several questions on your hashtag, sir. Uh, would you like to take those please? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to look at them. Um, uh, you know, um, there was one about um, safety assessments and, um, you know, what is the stages at which uh, they are done. And I think I answered that. Uh, they are, you know, safety is measured uh, in both in administration and in trials across many time scales from immediate to a few days to a few months. So the follow up of all that is, is important and necessary. And therefore, it's, it's really uh, ongoing process, even during the vaccine uh, licensure. I mentioned that. Um, so um, another question is about whether an uh, inactivated virus strain is likely to be more is likely to be more effective against uh, mutated strains that subunit vaccines uh, and recombinant vaccines are. Now, um, and that's, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So as I said, the inactivated virus has components on it um, uh, which it presents to the body. Um, components which, uh, sorry, there was some background noise. Uh, so it has components which are uh, other than the key components which most viral proteins have, uh, uh, most vaccines have, which are the spike protein, or the receptor binding domain and so on. So it is to the entire virus. Now, of course, when that is broken up and seen by the body, antibodies are raised to all these compounds. And how effective it is depends on how much those other components are important in combating the virus. Some of them may be peripheral, some of them may be important. So it depends on that, but it certainly broadens the repertoire. There are, by the way, very importantly, uh, related to this point, uh, while, as I said, many virus uh, vaccine developers have focused on the spike protein, uh, which is one protein, or just its receptor binding domain, uh, there are others, and particularly uh, in our context in India, uh, some who have been uh, developing vaccines against multiple components of the uh, virus, uh, not just one protein, but three proteins together. Uh, and therefore, that will certainly broaden the repertoire. So that was uh, one question from uh, which came uh -huh. on the. There is a question sir, from Shweta uh, Kotecha. She says, "What is the difference between the vaccines of the Serum Institute of India and Bharat Biotech?" 
um, that I did mention earlier, but I'll just reiterate. Yeah. Um, the Serum Institute is the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, which is a vectored vaccine. It uses a, a chimp adenovirus vector, uh, and this vector is a standard vector used for vaccination. Uh, it's been used in many contexts, and it doesn't actually cause any infection at all. And then it puts into that the genomic information, which codes for a component of the virus, which against which we want the immune response, because that's the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, related to the previous question, we must also remember that when the immune response is raised against this, it is also raised against the components of the vector. So that's why you know one needs to have a situation take care that the, the booster dose and other kinds of steps are measured to make sure that the viral response to the protein is also there. And those steps, those those work has been done. Uh, the Bharat Biotech co, uh, Covaxin vac uh, vaccine in partnership with ICMR, the Indian Council for Medical Research isolated the virus and uh, gave it to Bharat Biotech and they grow the virus and they inactivate it. So it's completely you know, dead. And therefore it's the entire virus against which the immune system works. Uh, both of them are very you know, important ways of looking at vaccines. They're different. They're both uh, you know, certainly uh, going to be very strongly uh, you know, standard protocols. There's nothing to be, uh, you know, there's nothing novel about it. The only truly novel kind of approach which we are fascinated by all over the world is the mRNA vaccine, uh, which I talked about earlier. And that's you know, something which is coming in for the first time. Dr. Krishnan uh, Narayanan writes in to say, is there any pattern from the earlier vaccines in India which can you know, make us discern uh, how the public has responded to this vaccine? Sir? Um, you know, yeah, yeah no, I, I, I get the question. Um, there have been very major vaccination programs uh, in India over many, many decades. The smallpox program uh, was something which was there a long time ago. Um, I was just uh, remembering how, you know, um, people used to come uh, when I was a kid, they used to come home with a stuff, uh, you know, sterilize the ring, uh, dip it in the uh, uh, vaccine, uh, and then put it on your arm. And people who in that generation had a smallpox vaccine had a ring mark uh, on their arm and then had you know, two oh, ring marks uh, to, to do that. Uh, so that was a smallpox vaccine, and there was a very wide uh, deployment of that. But I don't recall a wide, uh, even later on, talking to people much older than me, a wide communication about it. The polio campaign was different because not only was it deployed widely, but there was an enormous campaign. And this pulse polio vaccine, the oral vaccine, uh, had a great campaign which was kicked off from uh, Delhi and went all over the country and resulted in oral polio vaccination. Uh, and now it has gone on to the final uh, closure phase. Uh, polio has been uh, eradicated from India, but we also have uh, preventive vaccination uh, going on. So that's those are the older kinds of vaccines. The Rotavac, again, uh, the Japanese... Um, uh, the Rotavac went into the childhood immunization. Uh, the maternal tetanus went to pregnant women. Uh, the measles and rubella vaccine was done in a major campaign mode recently. Uh, you know, so there have been lots of major vaccination programs, and all of the recent ones have been combined with good communication campaigns. So, uh, as we speak, we've gone uh, live on the My GOV Facebook page as well, so the viewers can uh, tune in there as well. So, we have another question from Abhay Mateshwar, and this is really very interesting. What are the precautions that we need to take after being vaccinated? I think this is a very important question, sir. Um, you know, when the, the dry runs have been going on for the vaccination program, and they, they put these in mind, there are three uh, stages of uh, precautions, uh, three stages of follow-up, which the vaccine uh, trials and the vaccine programs look at. They look at you immediately, after vaccination to see whether there is something called anaphylactic shock or not. Uh, and then, you know, that will take, you know, uh, tens of minutes or so. Uh, and then they check uh, 
few hours later, you, you are asked to report or a few days later whether there are any side effects. So you can be in contact. You have 24-7 helplines. These helplines are in multiple languages. So, you know, that shouldn't be a problem. As I said, you know, these, the uh, a vaccination will not in, uh, cause side effects of concern. Uh, and that is the expectation. And But as you go in larger and larger numbers of people, you might have concerns, which you can call up this helpline and talk. Remember that vaccines are given to adults also. And right now, the priority groups are frontline workers, healthcare workers, and people above 50. And all these categories of people will have other kinds of effects routinely, even without vaccination. They might, upon vaccination, think that some of these uh, presentations Uh, allow them to call up and check and be reassured that they, you know, they, uh, that there's nothing amiss. So, Shivastava MM writes in to say, what is the extent of the efficacy of the present vaccine for the mutant virus, sir? Uh, that's a very important question. But, you know, before I uh, go to that, before I forget, I just want to add, uh, answer one question, which came up in the uh, uh, Ask the PSA hashtag, uh, which is um, about why, um, uh, you know, uh, what are the manufacturing approvals given to vaccines uh, before um, they were uh, deployed? And this is very important. Normally, uh, our regulator and regulators all over the world say that you can bulk stockpile only after vaccines are approved and not before. And what we have done this time, and this was done a few months ago, is to, at risk, at the manufacturer's risk, allow the manufacturers to stockpile vaccines should approvals come. And that is a very important uh, uh, you know, uh, step because that allows a parallel processing. And if approvals come, those vaccines can be deployed speedily. So the manufacturing time is saved. On the other hand, if approvals didn't come, then there would be risk and uh, you know, at, at cost to the manufacturer. So it's a manufacturer's loss. So that was one question I wanted to answer. Uh, sorry, go ahead. You had a question. Uh, sir, uh, this question was, uh, <clears throat> what? No, no, we've done this question. I'll go, go on to the next one. I'm not sure that it's been phrased well, but it has come on your hashtag. So I'm reading it out. It's from Mr. Chandrakan. What if the vaccine immunity lasts around 8 to 12 months are these really enough to vaccinate all Indian citizens? I'm not sure what you're asking, Chandrakant, but I'm taking it since you sent it, sir. You no, know, I think the question is an important one, uh, which is, you know, um, what will happen to our immunization program against the SARS-CoV-2 as we go on to subsequent years? Will the immunity last or not? Um, of course, the expectation is, as I said earlier, that the immunity due to the vaccines will be uh, a significantly long. Certainly, we think over a year. How long, we don't know. But remember, this is now, once we start vaccinating and complete vaccinating uh, a very large part of our population, there will be a range of people who have been vaccinated at different times. The earliest ones might start losing their immunity. They will be vaccinated again. And then over time, the later ones will start decreasing their immunity and they'll be vaccinated. So it's an incremental change, uh, uh, incremental addition, which we will see in our vaccination. It's not small, but that's something which is uh, the system can more readily deal with uh, without being stretched. So the question we left out, Great. sorry, no. the question we left out, I'm going back to that again. What is the extent of the efficacy of the present vaccine? For the mutated virus. This comes to us from Sri Bhastava MN on your hashtag, sir. Um, you know, there is no such thing as the mutated virus. The, the virus which originated uh, and had the spillover in Wuhan, China, traversed the globe, and as it went, it accumulated many, many mutations. Those mutations, by and large, are a timestamp over space of where all it has gone and what changes that occurred. And by and large, many of them didn't affect the transmission or the uh, intensity of the disease. And therefore, they are just useful to know where the virus has traveled. But some changes have been very important. 
The first change took place in February 2020, and that strain has essentially dominated the world. And that therefore took over the original strain with a certain increased transmission. Subsequently, there have been three events of very important concern, three kinds of mutations. One is a so-called uh, UK strain, which I talked about, which has, as I said, even during the period of lockdown earlier, spread and the consequences of that we're seeing in the UK. The other is a strain in South Africa, which similarly has increased transmission and also is a matter of concern. And third is a set of mutations which took place in a Danish mink colony in an animal uh, mm. you know, host, as it were, which also decreased the immune response of the minks. And that's a cause for worry, but fortunately that didn't go out at all. In these cases, the vaccines, by looking at molecular analysis and every other tool, we think that the current repertoire of vaccines will still work against these. So, but as I said, it's very important to keep in mind, you know, we should not focus only on whether the vaccines work against these strains or not. It's very important to keep in mind that some of these strains I've talked about, the UK and the South Africa variant, seem to increase transmission enormously. Remember, I would repeat, the power of the exponential. Few people who get this strain transmit to a few others, that doubles, that doubles, and soon you see a situation what has happened in the UK. And therefore, the speedy use of vaccines across the population is very important. So that benefit of a speedy deployment should be seen against the dangers of not doing so. Correct, sir. And uh, then that's how a whole new wave comes in. And then uh, we found wanting because uh, <clears throat> it can get out of hand. Sir, the next question that I want to ask you now is, could you throw some light on the phase three trials? So that's also coming on our hashtags. Yeah, I mean, obviously phase three trials are those where you expose uh, people to the pathogen. But there are two categories of people in the trial those who get the vaccine and those who don't. And let us say, for example, that you unblind this trial. It's a blinded trial. So you don't know who you're giving the vaccine to and who you're giving the placebo to. And then you find that three people in the vaccine arm showed a progression of disease and 97, let's say, in the other arm, uh, showed in the placebo arm, showed a progression of disease. So you would say out of 100 people, 97 uh, didn't get the disease in this arm, but uh, and only three got it. That's the, that's the interpretation of that. So that's what a phase three trial is about. And this can be at different scales, uh, depending on the disease and depending on the severity of the disease in the population. You might decide, you might decide to do it earlier, uh, or you might decide to unblind it earlier, or you might decide to carry it on for a longer time. So another question that I wanted to ask you now is emergency use in clinical trials. So would you like to throw some light on that as well? I'm sorry, uh, emergency use authorization. Uh, what is the question? The same. What is emergency use authorization? Sir? Yeah. So, you know, as we discussed, vaccines go through multiple phases of trials and typically uh, full authorization would come after you monitor the consequences of phase three trials for some time. Now, yes, given the emergency now, there are multiple points at which, depending on the nature of the emergency, that you could say, I want to start deploying the vaccine even as I continue the trials. So if the disease is very, very life-threatening, you might say, I, I want to you know, go right after phase one or even before phase one, uh, or you know, uh, not even do phase one. Uh, there are different kinds of diseases. For example, during the anthrax uh, poisoning, uh, there was a very early deployment of a potential anthrax vaccine because you know it's not something which is there widely in the population and an early introduction can protect. There are risks of deploying that vaccine uh, amongst those who are at uh, you know in danger, but the benefits are very high. If the disease is such that it's very mild, then you would you know uh, let the vaccine developments go its course. If the disease is covers a range of presentations, such as SARS coronavirus, COVID-19 does, then you would say that because of the huge impact on a very large population and the dangers of 
you know, in that situation of the likelihood of mutant strains arising, which can have even more severe impact, vaccination is a very important escape. And the sooner we do it, the better. And therefore, we need to do it earlier. So these are the kinds of, uh, you know, points which come up before regulators when they take a decision. One last question, sir, uh, on the vaccine, and then I perhaps may request you to throw some light on the way it's going to be provided to a billion plus citizens in India. <laughs> We've got a very uh, effective uh, methodology on all of that. I read about that. So the question is, does the vaccine work against the new strain of the virus? How quickly does it work and how long does it last against the new strain which you spoke about, sir? As I said, the challenge of the UK strain and the South African strain, which you've referred to as a new strain, is not so much about whether the vaccine works against it or not, but the extent of its spread. And even though it doesn't seem to cause more severe disease, it seems to spread a lot faster. And that means it will affect more people, and therefore there will be more people with more severe disease. And therefore it's important to deploy all the vaccines at hand speedily against it. Is the, are the vaccines likely to work against them? The answer, short answer is from everything we can guess from the biology of those changes and what it means. Yes, it, it, it does look like. Uh, will there be new mutations against which vaccines may not? We know that. Uh, and if that happens for that, we need to be sequencing the genomes of viruses, testing them in the lab, whether what kinds of changes will cause uh, vaccine um, escape and how how one can develop new vaccines. So we're simultaneously. These are not the two vaccines alone in our toolkit. We are simultaneously here developing many many vaccines. All of that will be very useful for a variety of reasons. And we're also developing vaccines which might likely to be not very very likely to be effective uh, against uh, new variants um, uh, which the current vaccines might have escaped. So, you know, we, we are putting every single uh, approach into the toolkit so that we are protected. And that's an amazing uh, consequence of science that it can do this on the run. That's something we should all appreciate. So one more question that's just come up on your hand. About 10 million people have recovered without any vaccine or medicine. So this person is trying to ask, do Indians really need a vaccine? What would you be your take? I would urge uh, the questioner to go to the COVID vaccine uh, trackers and see what devastation this has caused all over the world. It is true that most people recover and many people don't show the symptoms of the disease also. But this is a very, very unusual virus. It infects people in a manner where many of them are asymptomatic. And therefore, transmission is sort of under the radar, as it were. And then it hits some people very, very badly. The devastation it has caused is always there. And uh, or, or there to see, you just have to go to, uh, you know, different countries, look at what's happening in UK, um, in USA, all over uh, India, the total number of cases, the numbers of deaths, in Africa, in Europe. I mean, these are not small numbers. Different countries have had different ratios of those who've had problems and those who've not. But the devastation has been very, very high everywhere. So we should not treat this lightly. So does a vaccinated person also present a risk to the members of the family who are not vaccinated, perhaps? As I said, um, how much of uh, that you're protected against the progression of the disease? But how much of there is also virus in you, you're infected, of course. How much of that is shed is something on a large scale we don't know. Expectation is that shedding will be lowered substantially. But it's important that in a closed group, all those who are not vaccinated are protected, and therefore the person who's vaccinated should also take care, as should others. Uh, sir, if I may ask you uh, one question, sir, would you like to throw some light about how the vaccine is going to be given to a billion plus, uh, you know, Indians? Uh, what is the methodology, sir? So, um, the vaccines are to be manufactured, they're done in bulk, then they go into fill and finish, then they go into distribution chains. 
these distribution chains are start with extremely large warehouses which are appropriately refrigerated and then they go from there in refrigerated trucks to other warehouses which are also refrigerated and then they go from there to other locations so this is a chain which is powered in the sense the refrigeration is there right through and the last mile they can go in containers where temperature is maintained but they are not necessarily powered this whole structure is monitored by a it uh, backbone called the coven and that is an amplified version of what has been used for many years in the vaccine intelligence network to monitor our childhood vaccine and maternal vaccine delivery so this is this whole system has been going stress tests and tests dry runs again and again over the last few days and those are continuing and um, this should allow uh, correct delivery of the vaccines now at the other end at the you know person is getting vaccinated those trials involve the uh, dummy runs as it were of vaccination rooms to see that you know you go into one place who vaccinates it go into the next room who monitors how the data is entered is the data secure uh, are you do you know which uh, date you are vaccinated how do you know when your next date is when your next appointment is what happens if you couldn't come for the first appointment uh, how can you get rescheduled all of that is also being uh, tested and tried out right sir so that answers all we have yet another question and this is very interesting sir i'd like to take this as we know that different strategies have been used to formulate or synthesize a vaccine so what approach has been used essentially for the development of the covid-19 vaccine in india sir uh sorry i i missed that yeah go ahead i i i'll uh, rephrase it again the question is as we know that different strategies have been used to formulate or synthesize a vaccine which approach has been used for the development of covid-19 vaccine in india i already addressed that there are you know um, uh, the two major ones i told you but there are many others which are in progress there is a company looking at an mrna vaccine another company looking at you know expressing three different proteins uh, yet another company expressing a uh, viral protein in a thermostable manner so there are multiple other approaches by the way i was just pointed out someone said that you know uh, sars cov2 is not ebola and therefore the emergency uses uh, for ebola don't match here. i i i should clarify i'm not saying it is equivalent i'm saying that for different vaccines there are different kinds of emergency uses given and i gave ebola as an example of what one could do and how you know one could do it differently for other diseases and for sars cov2 i pointed out the the emergency comes not because of the nature of the disease it's very complex it covers a wide range of uh, presentations but because of its extraordinary spread and that continuing danger of that spread allows more mutant strains to arise and therefore the speedier the vaccination program the better uh, sir another question coming in to us from uh, uh, on your hashtag can a person get the covid-19 vaccine without registration in the health department these are going to be questions which uh, you know we will worry about a little later if i may <laughs> yeah this is more related to the admin so i'm sure uh, uh, your district or at the grassroots level wherever you are um, you will get that uh, kind of information anything else you'd like to say on uh, the vaccine uh, development of covid-19 in india sir and uh, perhaps you know can we expect more such pandemics in the future or is this the last uh, that we're seeing <laughs> this is <laughs> special well you know the last year has been extraordinary um it's not that potential pandemics were not discussed or thought likely to be happen but we didn't really see it happening uh you know on a given time such a short period everything all it was to have later they happen now that said you know there are very very important lessons to be learned from this it was not that the uh, coronavirus pandemic was not something which was completely unknown the intensity and the way this particular virus behaves was something which we didn't know 
But we learned about it a lot in the early days, and that's quite remarkable. And that's something, first of all, we should keep in mind. The second point we should keep in mind that this is unusual. It doesn't have the severity of a hit, which allows you to focus and eliminate it in a particular location. And therefore, its main feature is this extraordinary transmissibility without causing problems to a very large number of people, uh, but causing very serious problems to an extremely significant number. So this resulted in the breakdown of health systems. What is the way out of that? The way out of that when you don't have a vaccine is to have non-pharmaceutical interventions of various kinds. Masks were extraordinary, and we should actually credit our system for putting that up front early. Many Asian countries also use masks a lot, and it's possible that the deployment of masks had a very major impact all over these places. So these kinds of non-pharmaceutical interventions were one major tool. The other major tool, which potentially was there, was the development of drugs. Now that didn't take off, despite many early promises, that didn't take off rapidly in terms of prevention against the virus, but that was expected because viruses replicate very rapidly and there's a small time window where drugs can act. And they use our own machinery. To get, therefore, a drug which is safe against the virus but doesn't affect us badly is a big challenge. But we did get dexamethasone, which affects the uh, you know, um, uh, disease development rather substantially. And we learned a lot in terms of deployment of non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions such as ventilators, oxygen, and other kinds of interventions, which uh, was very, very important. So we learned how to get the disease down. We also learned enormously by sequencing the virus's genes to see what was happening. And that's something which has happened more and more intensely recently. And this is very important because it forewarns us about what can happen. It is not something we must keep in mind that if you have a vaccine, you can wait and you do everything for it to deploy and choose the right time. That's the perfect world. You have to balance those kinds of very difficult decisions about when to introduce with what's happening with the virus. The scale of the pandemic, by definition, it's across the world, means that there are going to be variants which have all sorts of problems. We've seen one with increased transmission. We will definitely, given enough time, if we don't do anything, see strains with other kinds of problems. Before that, we must quench the virus. How do we do that? Three things. One, we must start vaccination on scale very rapidly and widely. Second thing, remember that if you vaccinate, how many people vaccinate? If a vaccine has to be effective, then it'll be good to vaccinate a small number of people where the entire community gets immunity. For that to happen, transmission effectively has to be low. That is in our hands, so we must we cannot change the transmission of the virus, but we can change the effective transmission by doing the third thing, which is wearing masks and keeping distance. So even if there are mutant strains which increase transmission, if we can reduce their transmission by keeping distance, it will be very valuable. That was not done in the UK. The, even though there was a lockdown, the strain spread, but there was a period where the lockdown wasn't very effective during Christmas and the New Year, and that caused serious problems. So it's very important for us to have these non-pharmaceutical interventions while we deploy the vaccine. So vaccine introduction is very important. The scale of the pandemic needs to be appreciated. The devastation it has caused needs to be appreciated. And we must therefore move now our discussions while asking all the important questions which we have, we should continue to ask them, but we should move also into a discussion on how to ensure that vaccines are widely used, accepted, and make sure that the, our community, uh, our country is vaccinated so that we can you know, uh, reduce this disease to nothing and also do that and help the world do that. Indian manufacturing has got a great responsibility to uh, deliver to the world. Both companies which have got emergency use authorization have delivered to the world on multiple vaccines. Other companies are there which have also delivered. So this is a responsibility we have to not just India, but to the whole world. Absolutely, sir. And as you rightly said, uh, it is our genuine hope that people will emerge more conscious, not only about their health and life, but also about the environment around them and um, uh, rebuild their future. 
So one last message for a billion plus Indians. They're waiting for your message. So what would your message be to India on vaccines? Yeah. I think, you know, this is really a very important development that vaccines have come out. But we must simultaneously keep in mind our responsibility as citizens. And they fall into three categories. <clears throat> All of us, when we have the opportunity, should participate in clinical trials everywhere and for anything, for vaccines, for drugs. In this case, we're talking about vaccines. So that's a very important uh, duty as citizens, uh, not just here, but for people everywhere in the world. The second point is communication. It's important, of course, to ask various kinds of questions about vaccination and vaccines and the development. And that is, is absolutely correct. And they should be answered and will be answered. At the same time, please communicate the value of vaccination to the large public in multiple ways, whether in the media, from the media, from our science institutions, from our state governments, from our central government. This is very, very important. And the third point is, remember, the introduction of vaccines is distinct from the deployment and use of vaccines. Those take time. So aid the machinery to make sure vaccine deployment is eased. We have the process that takes time. You know, we heard from the government today that the 30 crore vaccination uh, of the priority groups will take seven to eight months. That's a significant period. And 30 crores, I mean, this has not been tried anywhere in the world. 30 crores as, you know, in a population of 130 crores. And this is a huge effort. So we must all appreciate that it takes time to deploy even into this priority group and then into others. So we must be patient and follow all measures. And that's very, very important. And on that note, sir, many thanks for joining us in this very, very interesting conversation. I thank you on behalf of the entire team of India Science. Um, thank you for sharing your wonderful insights. And we hope uh, that uh, we will have more such conversations in future. With this, viewers, it's a wrap on this edition of the Science Behind Vaccines. I thank you all for watching. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you very much. I just have one point. Uh, if there are any questions which uh, we may not have answered, uh, I'll be certainly happy to take them uh, separately and get back to them uh, on social media. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Namaste. Namaste.